Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. It's Tuesday, August 31st. This is The Gateway. I'm Wayne Pratt. The St. Louis Board of Aldermen has passed a resolution extending a mask mandate issued by the city's acting health director. Such a step is required by a new state law limiting the authority of elected executives to issue public health orders. Anyone over the age of five must wear a mask inside public places or while on public transportation. The resolution also requires the city to give aldermen an update on vaccination efforts by September 11th. And at this point, just 40 percent of St. Louis's residents are vaccinated. Officials are hoping to quickly boost that number, but say masks are a way to protect all from the highly contagious Delta variant. 7th Ward Alderman Jack Coder led the effort to pass the resolution. We probably would all prefer if, if the doctor and, and the mayor's office could make these orders in a more nimble fashion. But this is what we're left with. This is what state law requires. Uh, and I'm glad we're doing this. And I think it sends a strong message that we're doing this unanimously. The resolution extends the mask order through September 29th. Lawmakers are back in Springfield today for what's supposed to be a one-day special session to deal with fixes to new legislative maps in Illinois. But the General Assembly is also staring down two deadlines that could jeopardize the clean energy future most lawmakers and Governor J.B. Pritzker say they want to create. Hannah Meisel reports. Without action from lawmakers, nuclear giant Exelon is prepared to permanently close the first of two power plants this fall. In Illinois' burgeoning renewable energy sector, it will lose out on more than $300 million in subsidies. Pat Devaney of the AFL-CIO, who is leading negotiations on behalf of organized labor, is urging environmental groups to compromise because there is just too much on the line to do otherwise. But unions have also dug in their heels to save jobs at coal-fired power plants, a key issue that's held up the energy deal all summer. Environmental groups want to force the shutdown of those major polluters, and Governor Pritzker says he won't sign a bill without significant decarbonization targets. I'm Hannah Meisel. Attorneys general from 20 states, including Missouri, are suing the Biden administration in an effort to halt directives that extend federal sex discrimination protections to members of the LGBTQ community. Those protections range from transgender girls participating in school sports to the use of school and workplace bathrooms that align with a person's gender identity. The lawsuit argues legal interpretations by the U.S. Department of Education and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission are based on a faulty view of U.S. Supreme Court case law. The Department of Justice did not immediately respond to a request for comment on the lawsuit. St. Louis Public Radio has selected a veteran public radio leader as its new chief executive officer. St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Fenton reports Tina Pamantuan will fill the role that has been vacant for almost a year. Pamatuan has worked as an editor, writer, and teacher of audio journalism and serves on the national NPR board. As head of the station, she'll supervise staff, create budgets, and manage daily operations. Pamatuan, who's Asian American, says she hopes to create more opportunities for staff members and particularly people of color. I'm definitely an example of somebody who thought at one point, I don't belong in this industry and I, I could easily leave. So I think being able to come in with that perspective that you you understand what that feels like, it's powerful. Pam Atuan is currently general manager at a public radio station in San Francisco. She fills the role left by former general manager Tim Eby, who resigned last year amid accusations of racism and mismanagement. I'm Sarah Fenton, St. Louis Public Radio. The U.S. Department of Agriculture and conservationists have been urging farmers for years to plant other crops in between harvests. The procedure is supposed to prevent erosion and enrich the soil. But as Harvest Public Media's Seth Bodine reports, growing what's known as cover crops may not be worth it in drier areas. Jimmy Emmons has all sorts of things growing in his fields in Leedy, Oklahoma. Peas, beans, there's about three different kinds of, of grazing sorghum. There's millets in here. But he doesn't plan to harvest any of this. Instead, these are cover crops, plants grown in between cash crops to cover the ground and preserve it. 
Emmons digs into his field. He's looking at the dirt, even smelling it. Smells real earthy and sweet. More and more farmers like Emmons are practicing this technique. And it also got a shout out in President Joe Biden's first address to Congress as a way to help slow climate change. Farmers planting cover crops so they can reduce the carbon dioxide in the air and get paid for doing it. According to the Ag Census, farmers planted 50% more cover crops in 2017 than in 2012. Scientists like Augustina Bohr at Kansas State University says that's good for the environment. Growing a cover crop to cover the soil, to provide residue to protect the soil, that, that is great. We've seen that when we take soil measurements, we do soil analysis, we see improvement in soil properties. But scientists like Obor says it doesn't always make sense economically, especially in dry regions like Oklahoma and Kansas. David Nielsen is a retired U.S. Department of Agriculture researcher. He says it all comes down to a scientific concept called Liebig's Law of the Minimum. It says the availability of the most limited quantity will be what affects growth or yield. Nielsen says in the Great Plains, crops like wheat need every drop of water they can get. So you take water away and the yields are going to go down. He says cover crops don't always make sense, especially for farmers who don't irrigate their wheat. Jimmy Kinder relies on rain to water his winter wheat fields in Walters, Oklahoma. I tried it for five years and three of the five years it was actually a negative impact on the crop. Kinder says he is an anti-cover crop, but it just doesn't make sense for him. It seems to be difficult to get an economic or even a soil health return from planting a summer cover crop in a short period of time. Kinder says that's why the practice hasn't gotten a foothold with a lot of wheat farmers. Vance Emke owns a seed company in Kansas, but he tells farmers not to use cover crops. It's, it's just a gigantic fraud. I, and the thing that is fascinating to me is that it is so widespread and it has just kept going on and on and on. And he says he tries to dissuade farmers because the costs add up quickly. Some seeds can cost $35 an acre. Then you've got transport, transporting of seed, you've got planting, you've got termination costs. I mean, you're just digging a deeper and deeper and deeper hole faster and faster and faster. Most scientists agree that cover crops do best in places where there's more consistent rain. Even Jimmy Emmons, who travels the country encouraging other farmers to grow cover crops, says he's seen some crop loss in his fields in Oklahoma. He says that it's a small price to pay for the environment. But even in dry areas, there's one way this practice makes economic sense for farmers, grazing. If I can take $100, $150 of beef off of that, that's a pretty good return on my investment besides the benefits that it's doing for the soil. Keeping it covered, not blowing away, not washing away when we get a heavy rain. Whether it's feeding cattle or payments for reducing carbon, farmers may need to make their crops, even cover crops, pay. Seth Bodine, Harvest Public Media. Harvest Public Media covers agriculture in the Midwest. Shula Newman is the executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Wayne Pratt. This has been The Gateway. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.